Well, I think it's only right that we celebrate a little longer than one day, isn't it? So that's fine to have a whole weekend uh, to, to think on things that are, are important in our history, in our, in our background, uh, but also to ensure that we bring in right into what does it mean to us today? What's the significance of these things uh, for us today? So I am going to speak a little, but two, just two little things about St. David's, and I'm going to spend most of the time speaking about the same Savior and Lord that he worshipped, the Lord Jesus Christ. And I think he would have it that way. We do think about that little thing that, uh, that he would say to us, do the little things, do the little things. That's one of the most things that we, we try and remind people about. He said to us, do the little things. I just want to think about something small. In our thinking, in our context, that the, the Lord Jesus Christ did, but had so much significance and pointed forward to even the most significant thing ever. I'm going to read from John's Gospel, chapter 13, and I'm going to try and keep reminding you of that. If you'd like, you have it in front of you, just keep it open. But I'm just going to read it so that we can enjoy it together from verse 1 of chapter 13 of John's Gospel. He washes the feet of the disciples. Now, that's a very strange thing for us in our context today. But you might understand, and perhaps we should say that very at the very beginning. You know, for you to be comfortable at a, in a home or in a meal, to have, uh, you know, uh, to come into that place and to be accepted and welcomed, there will be someone there to prepare for you uh, the ability to wash your face and wipe down your face and to put perhaps some oil on yourself to, to uh, the of the hot and the dust of the day, and particularly the feet itself, someone perhaps to, to take a, a, a sandal that you might have worn, a shoe that you might have worn, and taken that off, and then got down with a bit of water, and washed your feet, and dried your feet, and you would be comfortable, and you know, clean, and ready for the, to enjoy the meal together. That's the background. We perhaps need to understand that. Uh, usually that was... Well, we might say the, the humblest, the lowest person in the household to do that. And uh, if they had servants or, or even slaves in those days, then it would be the sort of the youngest and the lowliest or the newest that would do that job because no one else wanted to do it. Who would ever want to wash the feet of someone? Well, for, particularly for me, that's really off-putting, the feet of someone. I must be honest about that, okay? So now we come and we understand God's word where it says in chapter 13 of Gospel of John, now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And the supper being ended and the devil already having put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and that he was going to God, arose from the supper, laid aside his garments, took a towel and girded himself. And after that, he, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet, and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. And then he came to Simon Peter, and Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? And Jesus answered and said to him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but you will know after this. And Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. And Jesus said, If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Oh, Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my, and my head. And Jesus said to him, he who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean, and you are clean. But not all of you, for he knew who would betray him. Therefore he said, you are not all clean. So when he had washed his feet, or when they had washed their feet, taken his garments and sat down, he said to them, do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord, your teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, 
nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. God, we pray, will art a, a blessing to hearing and reading his word this afternoon. Now, much of what was written of, of the patron saint of Wales, uh, David, was written some 400 years after he lived. And some of the things we can hold on to and can be relied on, and some of the things we have to admit might be exaggerated. Not that the Welsh ever do that, do we? How very different are the things recorded here in God's Word? How very different. How reliable is this account? These Gospels are written just within a generation of the very events that there are still those who are alive who heard and touched the Lord Jesus Christ. And they would be able to attest to the truth of his words and the actions of the, of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you might be thinking, well, well, we're going to speak about the big things, the important things and the significant things. Why are we talking about something small? I want to see it as a picture of not only what he was like, but what he did for us and who he is. And I think we can say well, about David, we can say this, that he, he lived a very simple life and a very simple motto of love. He did the, the little things and he wanted others to follow his example. But when we lift this to the Lord Jesus Christ, we see that he also did the little things that pleased the Father. In fact, we can say he did all things that pleased the Father. It wasn't in the big things only, but in the little matters. There was a moment in his, in his life where, where, if you like, almost greatness beckons, but he was just 12 years old. And in the end of Luke chapter 2, you'll find these scriptures that he's there, in, if you like, we would say today, in the, the top university of his generation, in the capital city of Jerusalem. And he's amazing the scholars, the intellectuals, if you like, of their day, and by his questions and by his answers. And yet, when his parents call him, he goes back and he is subject to his mother and to his earthly father Joseph for year after year after year. And in the smallest of things, he honoured his mother and father. And what we know is, and the scripture tells us, is that he increased in wisdom and stature and in favour with God and men. Now in all those secret, quiet little things, what does God have to say about? We don't know the detail, but before he went into public ministry and appeared before all men publicly, God opens up heaven. At the end of those years of quietness in backward town Nazareth, God opens up heaven and declares, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. He did all things to please the Father. You know, we could have turned to many different things, the little things you might say. He saw the little things that were done. He would notice these things and he would respond to them. It might be a widow who would only have just these two little copper coins to drop in. No one else would see, but he would see. And he would remind us and record it for us. It might be a woman who's been caught and she's ashamed and she's undressed. And he would look down and he would not condemn her. It might be a woman who wanted to remain anonymous and touch a, at a cloth or, or the bottom of, her, of his robe and, and secretly go away and he would stop and he would call her in to affirm her faith and that she would go in peace. It might be for a, for a, for, a foreign woman who, whose, whose life was tough and survival was all that she knew in the midst of abuse and he would go out of his way to find her and to reach to her and to bring her into life. He loved those who were invisible, we say, those who were unloved. He loved those who were looked down on, even the children. It's lovely to see them again this afternoon. Even the children, he loved them. The little humble things. 
He touched the untouchable and he would he and he would he would reach out and speak to those who were ignorant and he would heal the poor when only the rich knew health and he would go out of his way for those who were lonely. If you don't know this person, Jesus Christ, this Savior Jesus Christ, this wonderful Jesus Christ, the Word of God opens him to us. And we pray the Spirit of God, even tonight or another time, will bring the reality of him. To you. So I want us to look at something small, we might say, that he did to his disciples, a small, lowly thing that no one else was prepared to do. They weren't prepared to do it for each other. They weren't prepared to even do it for the Lord Jesus Christ. He washed their feet. That job of the lowest person in the household, the youngest slave, he does it. But he not only does it, he does it to a group of disciples who were unwilling to do it themselves. He said, well, I wanted to do it for themselves, or for each other, or even the Lord Jesus Christ. And it speaks of someone, a character, and a nature of someone that we don't know or we wouldn't ever have met before. It speaks of a man whose essence and image is that of the only true loving God that there is. For that's who he is. He is God in human form, Jesus Christ. And it's sort of in the context of what he did in that upper room washing their feet, face, feet rather, strikes home to me today as to who Jesus Christ is and what he has done. He washed their feet when they were refusing to do it for themselves when they were refusing it to do it to each other, and they were even refusing to do it to the Lord Jesus Christ. He loves in a different way. He washed their feet, and he doesn't stand on all that he is, and his rights, and his authority. He doesn't put that aside. And he, as he takes that garment off, you can see it pictorially, can't you? As he kneels down before them, and he prepares to serve those who he had created, who had rejected his way. He washes their feet, even though it's just hours before they will what? They will betray him. They will deny him. They will flee and desert him and leave him alone. Do you see the character and the nature of this man being so different to you and I? He washes their feet but this is only a picture of what he's about to do for them. Just within 24 hours, he's going to lay down his life for them. He's going to lay down his life upon a cross. You see, that other small thing teaches us something of the most significant thing. Within hours, he's going to allow those whom he created to take him that he may be crucified. That he may serve these disciples who will betray and deny and flee and desert him. That he may serve them, not with the washing of feet, but by his death and his blood shed upon the cross. Through the cleansing of all sin, forgiveness and righteousness may be given. Eternal life through his sacrificial death upon a cross, not clean feet but clean hearts. And this is our reading, and we see this act of Christ within 24 hours, as it were, foreshadowing. I don't know if that's a word, so forgive me for that. But it's just telling us, and it's giving us a glimpse what he's going to do within 24 hours for them. He's going to humble himself. He's going to lay aside all that he is and take on the dust and the dirt of sin upon himself that he may pay the price for our sin, that we may know what it is to have a clean heart before God. Here, he's just taken the place of another who should have washed the feet of Jesus and the disciples. But there on the cross, he takes my place. And there, he takes my sin and he bears my sin before a holy God that justice and judgment may be done that he may offer forgiveness and righteousness and life to us as the free gift of God. 
And so we see, and I want you to understand these are the scriptures, not man's thoughts. These, we see the scriptures, we see the word of God telling us in 2 Corinthians, for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him, in Christ Jesus. I suppose we could have taken a text this evening, we could have taken the text of Matthew 20, where it would say, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Now, as what always my wife would say, the introduction is longer than the three points that I'm going to make. So these are just the three points I want to make this afternoon. Why did he do it? What did he do? Who did he do it for? And we're going to look at the washing of the feet, but we know what we're thinking about. We're thinking of the cross. Why did he do it? What did he do? Who did he do it for? Well, you can look at verse 1 of this chapter. Why does he do it? The hour of the cross is upon him, it tells us the next day. The time when he will leave this world and return to the Father, just 40 days away or so now. In the context of these two significant things, his thoughts are for the love of his disciples. Not that they had just unclean feet, but that he would go to a cross. And he would pay the price for their sin, for my sin. And we see these recorded words here in verses 1. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. What does that mean, to the end? Well, you might say, to the end of life, death on a cross. To the end, there's been, there would be no other way to express love. It's completely and perfectly now shown and re revealed to us that he has laid down his life for us. For this purpose, to this end, for this purpose, that he may gather us. The word of God tells us, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross and despised the shame. All these things. All I know is this, having loved them, there is no end to his love. His end is, his love is made complete and he holds nothing back and loves them again in all ways, in all things and completely as the cross shows to us. Two scriptures for this then. One will know. I know I miss, one day I won't be able to say that confidently, but I think I can say it tonight. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The scripture, second scripture tonight is this. It's not from the Gospel of John, but from the Epistle of John. In this, the love of God was manifested towards us, that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. I want to see now, what is it that he's done? And the context is, well, the time is late. The context is, who has he done it to? Well, even Judas, this Iscariot, the betrayer, is included. In fact, no one is left out as he goes around that room to wash their feet. The context is this, Jesus knows who he is. And the word of God tells us that again. He's the very son of God. He knows his rightful position. He knows that God has given all things into his hands. He knows that he's done all things well. He knows that he has come from God and he will go to God. And yet he's the one who gets up. Imagine the moment when they see Jesus take his robe off and come down and put that towel around him. Who is it doing this? Washing the feet? The sustainer and creator of all life? Who is it that's on a cross? It is God who became man. And yet he goes down and he doesn't just dress up in this. I, and I thought about this as something this afternoon. You know, he doesn't just do the dressing up bit. He gets down and he kneels and he pours the water and he washes their feet. 
That's not an easy thing. It's not a dip. He gets involved. He gets in the midst of them. And he pours these things out and he washes and dries the filthy feet. I don't know, it's not so easy to say. The filthy feet of the unworthy, those who refused. And if the parallel, parallel has not got you, the picture is clear. This is what the Son of God has done for me has done for you. When we had no hope and when we were refusing to hear God, God sent his own son and he took on body and he humbled himself and he became a man and he dwelt amongst us and he laid down his life as a ransom for us. And two scriptures to just lock that in your heart and in your mind. Romans 5, but God demonstrates his love towards us, his own love towards us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. But Philippians 2 gives us the full picture of this. Christ Jesus, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, something to be held on or grasped onto, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in likeness of men and being found as appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death even the death of the cross. Well, finally, who did, he for, who did he do it for? Well, I think you could say to me, well, James, you already laid this on thick, you know, because you've told us in verse 2, it's Judas, even Judas, even Judas? But you're going to say for a moment, but I don't see myself as Judas. Well, there were many in that room, all very different different backgrounds, different places. There was Peter obviously there, but there are others that are unnamed for us. There's some who we might think we're invisible to each other and invisible to God, although you're not. Verses 6 to 11 tells us the debate that the Lord Jesus has with, with an embarrassed Peter. And Peter is going for, Lord, you'll never wash my feet. You just wash everything, Lord. These two extremes appear in this debate and, and three things stand out for me in that. And they go like this. Jesus must do it or we'll never be clean. Secondly, we cannot wash ourselves. We must receive his washing. And thirdly, you are not all clean. Some are not right before God. Now that is an amazing, a startling and a disturbing statement, those three. And you will just briefly cover these. He must do it or we cannot be clean. What we are unable to do for ourselves, he has done it all for us. We cannot make ourselves right before God. The Bible tells us that we all sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is none good, no, not one. We need to accept this. Not to look to each other, to make a comparison, as it were, between James, that, that chap who comes along to bat the fun and every now and again, and I, I, I look at him and I don't think I'm so badly off. No, but to look at the Lord Jesus Christ and to admit the only one has ever shown us the glory of what God, or the glory of God, and the glory of what God wanted in man is him, is he. And we fail. And so we need to say, yes, Lord, not even me. I cannot wash away my sins. To be clear, I cannot remove my guilt before God. And we must receive his washing, not for dirty feet, but, but for sin cleansing and for forgiveness and for righteousness. He has done it all that we may receive it and accept it by feet. There's Peter trying to hold off the Lord Jesus Christ. And pictorially today, people are pushing off the Lord Jesus Christ. They've got this reason and they've got rat that reason. But we are called by faith to accept and to receive the Lord Jesus Christ. And by faith is critical. That was the disturbing thing in the room. There was one who Jesus had washed his feet, but he refused to accept who Jesus is. There's one in that room there who, who is refusing to accept well, who Jesus is and what he has done for him. He's got his own idea of what God is like. Judas. He's got his own idea who God is. 
He's got his own idea of what God should do. And many of us today have the same thinking. God, if there's a God, should be like this. God, if there's a God, should do this. God, if this is God, how can he be Jesus Christ? And yet we are called by faith to accept who Jesus is and that his work upon the cross is sufficient and is enough that we may know God's forgiveness and God's righteousness. By faith we receive him as our righteousness. And I don't want you to take my words on these things. I'm going to lock the final two scriptures into your mind. You know, David of Wales stood up faithfully on two occasions in two synods in the 6th century. And he had to do it because there were there those who were teaching things that he believed were not of God or of the Bible. And he was a reluctant but renowned defender of our need of God's grace and spoke against the heresy of the day. And the heresy of the day was this. That man was capable. That man could do so much good without God's help. And David stood up and said, no. Everything we need is by God's gift and by God's grace. Hebrews 11 tells us this. But without faith, it is impossible to please God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is. And that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Romans 10 tells us that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Jesus washed their feet as an example that we should love one another and we should love one another. But he showed what he was about to do on the cross, which is the ultimate expression of love, the love of God towards you and me. Having loved us, he loved us to the end. He went to a cross. Although we did, rejected and did not deserve his love, his actions, or his salvation, we can, by receiving and accepting his work, be the very children of God. None of us. Nothing of us, rather, but all in who he is and what he has done for us. John 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt amongst us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. But then it sadly says, the world did not know him. The Word would not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God to those who believe in his name. Let's ask God to bless our time, his word, and our